Hi, Evan Montes of Call Throne. The Virgin Mary has transcended eras, cultures, and religions, and she's immensely popular around the world. This due to her apparitions and the traditions we have of her. There's a problem with this because the Virgin Mary is completely anti-biblical in what she says, what she does, and what she represents. The video you're about to see is an analysis, an investigation about her true identity and what her agenda really is. It's a video that intends on unmasking her, and I know it's a delicate topic because this woman is venerated. She's considered the mother of God, and she's very sacred to many, and I know that many will be offended with me. I don't intend on offending anybody, but I do intend on provoking provoking you to investigate if what I say is the truth or lies. This is important because there are two possible results in all of this, or I'm offending the mother of God and I'll answer directly to him, or you are being greatly deceived with something that can destroy you. So analyze this with a cool head. Welcome. To fully understand who the Virgin Mary is, it's no use looking in the Bible because she doesn't exist in the Bible. The Virgin Mary does not exist or come from the Bible. Therefore, the best place to learn about her is in Mary Shelley's literary masterpiece, Frankenstein. Now many of you might think that I'm making fun of the Virgin, that she really is in the Bible, but I'm being very serious. The Virgin Mary does not exist in the Bible. The young Hebrew maiden Miriam in the Bible, who was the mother of Jesus and wife of Joseph, she really existed. And that's why she is so incredibly different from the Virgin Mary, since the Virgin Mary is in fact Frankenstein, or at least similar to Frankenstein. Now, why would I say such a thing? In the 1931 classic Frankenstein, a scientist created an artificial being by artificial means putting and sewing together body parts that he had previously stolen from a cemetery and finally giving an artificial life. The scientist was ecstatic about his creation, thinking that it was magnificent, but in reality, he was totally blind to the monster he had created. You have created a monster and it will destroy you. Patience, patience. I believe in this monster as you call it. And if you don't, well, you must leave me alone. And because of his blindness, he continued harboring this monster in his life until it became completely apparent how destructive it really was for him. This is exactly the same story as the Virgin Mary, only instead of a mad scientist, we have the Catholic Church, who created this artificial woman by artificial means, putting together the parts of her character that they have created artificially throughout the centuries, and finally giving her artificial life and presenting her to the people as their celestial mother and the Queen of Heaven. And just like the mad scientist in the movie, the Catholic Church and the Mary devotees are completely blind to the monster they have right in front of them, thinking it's magnificent, that it's their mother, that it's the mother of God, not realizing it's a monster which is destroying them. Now, let's analyze all the artificial parts that were added to the Virgin Mary to create her character. The reason I say that all these characteristics are artificial is because they were all created by man. None of them exist in the Bible for the young Hebrew maiden Miriam. As a matter of fact, they're completely contrary to the persona of Miriam. For example, the title Mother of God was given to her by the Vatican in 431 AD in the Council of Ephesus. This title does not exist in the Bible because it is blasphemous. God does not have a mother. God is eternal. Jesus did have a mother for a short period of time, but that was in his human stage, and that was a long time ago. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Hebrew Miriam has no part in any of that. Another, her perpetual virginity, reason why she's called the Virgin Mary in the first place. This characteristic definitely does not come from the Bible, since the Bible says that Miriam had sex with Joseph. We're talking about a time when there was no television, radio, internet, or movies. The number one entertainment for couples was sex, and we see that Joseph and Miriam had lots of it because Jesus had a lot of siblings. The Bible informs us that two of his siblings were called James and Joseph, and that Miriam was the mother of these two. 
So then, where does this concept of perpetual virginity come from? Well, the earliest known reference we have for this doctrine is in an apocryphal gospel called the Gospel of James, which everybody recognizes and declares to officially be a false gospel. However, the Catholic Church used this apocryphal gospel as a reference to finally make the perpetual virginity of Mary official dogma of the Church in the year 451 AD in the Council of Chalcedonia. What's ironic about this is that the Catholic Church itself recognizes and admits that the Gospel of James is false. Another, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. This dogma was declared official by Pope Pius IX in 1854. The only reason this was done was because the people wanted their virgin to be immaculate. There was no reason, fundament, or evidence of any sort for this, especially considering that the Bible says the complete opposite, that everybody inherits sin thanks to Adam. So if you are conceived with the seed of a man, you have this curse, since man's seed carries this curse. This is why the Hebrew Miriam inherited this curse in her conception, and for that reason, she had sin in her life. And finally, the dogma of the assumption that never existed anywhere. It simply came about because one November day of 1950, the Pope of that time felt like declaring the assumption as official dogma with absolutely no evidence or fundament of any kind. But since popes are considered infallible when it comes to dogma, then this is as if God himself had declared it to the world. And that's how the Catholic Church created the Virgin Mary. But if we really want to make the analogy between Frankenstein and the Virgin Mary, we have to remember that Dr. Frankenstein didn't really create the monster so much as he assembled the monster from several body parts. And for this, he used a core torso. He had the central body of a corpse to which he joined all the other pieces. Likewise, the Catholic Church assembled the Virgin Mary with parts that they themselves created but that were joined to an already existing central body. So the question is, whose body? did they use? Who was she? Where did she come from? and birth. The Queen of Heaven. Isis was practically the most popular goddess in all of Egypt, not to mention the entire known world of that time and she was possibly the most powerful of all the gods since she possessed the secrets of magic. According to Egyptian mythology, Isis reigned in the land of Egypt with her husband brother Osiris, who was the first king of Egypt in a time when gods and men lived together. But Osiris had a brother, Seth, who was very jealous of him and wanted to kill him and take over the kingdom. Seth conspired against Osiris, murdered him, and took over the throne of Egypt. Worse still, Osiris didn't have an heir. But Isis, using her powerful magic, was able to revive Osiris and copulate with him one last time to get impregnated with a legitimate heir to the throne.
Osiris once again died. Horus, the only begotten son of the beloved Osiris, legitimate heir to the throne of Egypt. The immense popularity of Queen Isis with her baby god King Horus could not be contained in Egypt alone. It spread far and wide across the known world of then in different presentations according to the cultures and traditions of each region. But no adaptation of these two gods was more successful than in Roman Christianity. Which brings the question, how is it that so many religions and cultures fanatically embrace an Egyptian myth? Well, easy, because Isis is not a fictitious character of Egyptian mythology. Isis is a real being. One of the worst beliefs in our modern world is that the ancients were superstitious and believed in imaginary gods. This is a fatal mistake, because to misunderstand the past is to misunderstand the future. The pagan gods of yesterday were real, and the Bible gives testimony of this. Cast down my staff before Pharaoh, that he may see the power of God. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. When Moses entered into Pharaoh's presence for the first time, he demonstrated the supernatural power of God with his staff. But instead of being surprised or intimidated, the Egyptians simply did the same as Moses, taking their staffs, turning them into serpents because they too had a supernatural knowledge and power. Their entire culture was based on this. And that wasn't the only act of God they could imitate. When Moses turned the water into blood, the Egyptians did the same. When Moses made many frogs come out of the river, the Egyptian sorcerers did the same. And if the Bible isn't enough evidence for the supernatural knowledge and power that the Egyptians had, well then, just look at the pyramids of Egypt, which demonstrate a technology, engineering, astronomy, geology, geometry, and physics impossible for that era. Even for this era, there are some aspects of the pyramids we cannot replicate. The world and the Bible give testimony of the supernatural knowledge and power that the Egyptians had, proving the Egyptian gods were real. What's more, God himself confirmed it. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. 
Something we should understand about the 10 plagues of Egypt in the book of the Exodus is that this was indeed an earthly battle between Moses and Pharaoh, but at the same time, it was a celestial battle between God and the gods of Egypt. These 10 plagues were designed to attack and pressure Pharaoh in the physical domain by physical means, but at the same time, they were designed to attack and defeat the Egyptian gods in the spiritual domain. For example, the Egyptians worshipped the sky goddess Nut, who protected them from the forces of chaos thanks to the order she gave to the cosmos. Her husband was the earth god Geb, who provided fertility to the earth and vegetation for the Egyptians. And separating them was the god of the air, Shu, who was represented by Breeze, which was associated with tranquility, refreshment, and relaxation. With the ten plagues, the god of Israel demonstrated his supremacy to all these Egyptian gods. Newt was completely impotent to the hail and fire that destroyed the Egyptians from the sky. Geb was infested with lice, and Shu had a plague of flies that tormented the Egyptians in the places where he supposedly offered tranquility. The Egyptians saw how superior this god of the Hebrews was over all of their gods. In conclusion, the gods of Egypt were real, and they offered supernatural power, knowledge, and advances to the Egyptians. But the Bible tells us that there is only one true god, which means that these Egyptian gods, albeit real, were not really gods. They were demons, disguised as gods, with all types of offers of hidden knowledge and supernatural powers for mankind, with the purpose of taking humanity down paths of destruction. What Satan did on a large scale in Egypt is exactly what he did on a small scale in the Garden of Eden, which was to offer humanity knowledge by supernatural means with the purpose of turning them away from God and making them rebellious against him. Satan repeats this same offer to humanity in all eras and cultures, only that he changes the presentation. In the garden, a forbidden fruit was used. For all other cases, any bait that man bites into is used. Now, in order to understand Satan, what he did in the Garden of Eden, what he did in Egypt, what he has done throughout all the ages and all cultures, it is necessary to understand how it is that he deceives and operates. Satan's objective is to steal, kill, and destroy, but the method in achieving these objectives many times includes truth. In the beginning, God created two dimensions, the spiritual and the physical. Then, God created man with two very symbolic ingredients, one being the earth of the ground and the other being the breath of life, which means that man is composed so much of earthly material as he is of spiritual material. He is a two-dimensional being, and God put man in the place where heaven and earth met, in the Garden of Eden, because that's where the person was who united these two dimensions. Jesus. And there, the connection that man had between the physical and the spiritual was perfect, providing a perfect balance for his life, for his existence. But when man ate of the forbidden fruit, he died the very same day he did so, just as God said he would. Only that he didn't die in the physical, since he continued walking and talking, but rather he died in the spiritual. The perfect balance, harmony, and connection that he had between these two dimensions was destroyed and man lost his connection to God, disconnected from the source of life, to which God began a reparation process of that connection. Even though man would continue to be dead spiritually until the arrival of Jesus, God wanted to continue having a relationship and communion with him. Albeit now, this would have to be done with certain separation, in a more disconnected manner, to put it that way. God began to teach man to synchronize his earthly existence with the divine celestial kingdom, because despite the disconnection and separation from that kingdom, at least man could live parallel to it, and in this way, enjoy a certain reestablishment in his relationship to God. Man could synchronize with God and learn to walk with him again, just like Enoch did, just like Noah did, because that's what walking with somebody means, to be synchronized with that person's pace and thus be in step with each other. When God adopts Israel to be his people, the idea was for that nation to serve as the prototype of the celestial kingdom on earth. And in that way, all the other nations would see that this was the best of all the kingdoms in the world and with the best of all the gods in the world. All the nations would also want to implement this wonderful system. So God began to equip Israel with all the necessary tools to start the synchronization process. And one of the most important tools for this was the tabernacle. God showed Moses the temple that was in heaven and ordered a replica to be built on earth in order to create synchronization of God's presence in heaven with earth. And in that way, establishing the form in which man could interact with that presence. 
The tribe of Levi was sanctified to be the priests and ministers of this terrestrial temple. Why? Because the name Levi means connection. The tribe of Levi were the priests, those in charge of connecting the people with their God. And the instructions on how to make and maintain this connection came on Mount Sinai, best known as the Law of Moses, the Law of God. Even in the Our Father prayer that Jesus gave us, there is a declaration for this connection. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the most astonishing connection can be seen in the Gospel according to Matthew when Peter declares Jesus as the Son of God. With this declaration, Peter's spirit reestablishes with God the connection that got lost in the Garden of Eden. Peter is apparently the first human being to do this since Adam. How did he do it? By means of the person who creates the reconnection between God and man. Jesus. And for this reason, Jesus goes on to tell Peter that now he is synchronized and that whatever he does on earth will be done in heaven and whatever he undoes on earth will be undone in heaven. His earthly life was now in direct connection with the spiritual domain. Okay then, so what's the point of all this? Well, it's about understanding who the devil is and how he operates and how he deceives and destroys man. And the most successful way that Satan does these things is by doing parallels to what God does. Just as God looks to establish a connection with man, the spiritual with the physical, the celestial with the terrestrial, the devil does the same thing. The devil offers man to connect the spiritual with the physical, but by his own means, without necessity of Jesus. This was what happened in the Garden of Eden. Satan offered man knowledge so to become his own god and to have domain in both dimensions. Perhaps the second instant where we see this is in the Tower of Babel, where apparently man is trying to reach celestial places by his own means, building a high tower so to connect heaven and earth by his own means. And thus, in practically all the religions that deny Jesus as Lord and Savior, we see this equation as man's purpose of reaching celestial places, or of connecting heaven and earth in a way independent and elusive of Jesus Christ. And perhaps the most evident case of this was the ancient Egyptian culture. It's important to know that all this architecture, all these structures in Egypt were not some trendy designs of Egyptian style, but rather, these were all tools to connect heaven and earth. There's something that must be understood about Egypt of the Old Testament, and it is that besides its historical role, it also fulfills a symbolic role, which at the same time leads to a prophetic revelation. In the book of Exodus, Israel is symbolizing the kingdom of God, while Egypt symbolizes the secular kingdom. In that same sense, Moses symbolized Jesus, while Pharaoh symbolized Satan. Moses liberating the Hebrews from the slavery of Egypt was a prophetic shadow of Jesus liberating humanity from the slavery of sin. So Egypt in the Exodus is loaded with prophetic symbolisms, and if we investigate the Egyptian society of those times, it is possible that we'll find prophetic references about the secular society of these times, of things that will happen, how they will happen, and why. After all, the Bible says that everything repeats, that there is nothing new under the sun. So let's begin with the fact that Egypt possessed supernatural power and knowledge, only that it wasn't the entire society that possessed such things, but rather a small and elite group of adepts who after being initiated into these occult arts went on to positions of power in society. The supernatural power and knowledge that Satan gave to Egypt was hidden from the people in general and given to only a few so to manipulate and control the rest of the population. That's why there are no known records of how the Egyptians did what they did. They were a secret society, to say the least. However, the purpose of why they did it was recorded. Turns out that practically all the Egyptian temples and religious constructions were themselves a record in the sense that they were communicating something, be it astrological, astronomical, chronological, esoteric, spiritual, educational, or of any other type of relevant information to that culture. And inside the pyramids of the ancient Egyptian dynasties, we find texts engraved in their walls, which constitute the oldest writings that exist in the world. This collection of writings is known as the Pyramid Text, and they give Give us understanding about the beliefs and practices of the ancient Egyptians, including the function of one of the most important, not to say the most revealing, Egyptian temple, 
the Temple of the Phoenix. In this temple, there was a black stone called the Benben Stone, where the phoenix bird would arrive to mark the beginning of a new era. The Egyptians believed in cyclical or repetitive time, in which the sun passed through 12 zodiacal spaces, each one representing an era of humanity that will last 2,160 years. The culmination of each era came about with chaos and destruction. And from that, the new era would emerge, bringing along with it a new awakening with peace and harmony for all of humanity. And the phoenix bird represented these cycles of destruction and rebirth since it too would destroy itself in flames once it reached the end of its life, only to be reborn from its own ashes. For such, the Ben Ben Stone was a very important and sacred relic since it was where the phoenix would arrive and announce to humanity the big changes about to take place. In the Temple of the Phoenix, the Ben Ben Stone was mounted on a sacred column. What's interesting is that this stone had the shape of a cone. This apparently began the tradition of building all subsequent obelisks and pyramids in Egypt with a replica of the Ben Ben Stone on its top. This conical replica became known as the Pyramidion. Now, let's be honest, a cone-shaped stone on top of a long straight column? Doesn't that seem a bit anatomical? Or maybe we just need to get our minds out of the gutter, right? Well, let's consider a few things. First, the word benben means sperm or seed. Second, I believe the Egyptian myth of creation would be worth analyzing at this point. In the beginning, there was nothing but a sea of chaos called Nun. Out of this came a serpent that took the form of a god who would be the beginning of all creation. This creator god called himself Atum Ra. He was all alone and wanted to have children to accompany him. But since there was nobody to procreate with, he had to take matters into his own hands. Or hand, if you catch my drift. Atum Ra went on to stimulate himself and from his ejaculation sprang out two children, and from them a successive pantheon of gods. And that's the story of creation of the Egyptians. Everything came into being thanks to an enormous cosmic erection. But the Egyptians didn't ignore the other component that made creation possible, the hand of Atum Ra, which went on to be considered as his feminine side thanks to the function it had in the whole process. And with time, this hand ended up having its own name and identity, Seosis, grandmother, quote unquote, of all the gods. So it's no wonder why this fetish of creationism was worshipped in all of Egyptian culture and present in all their society. But as we've already seen, the Egyptians believed in cyclical time, so creation was not something of the past, but something repetitive. These obelisks and pyramids, with their peaks of stone semen or benben, were possibly used as announcements to proclaim the coming of a better cycle for humanity, like the seed which would give life to a new era. And what was this better era that they were proclaiming so much? This would be a good time to return to the topic of how Satan imitates God and parallels his truth. Why does he do that? Why imitate somebody you hate? Ironically, Satan's most effective strategy for reaching his goals is by resembling God as much as possible. Allow me to explain. If I tell you that in this picture Mary is the girl with white skin, blonde hair, and a green jacket, you can identify her easily, right? But if in this picture I tell you that Mary is the girl smiling with green eyes, blonde hair, and a silver necklace, identifying her will be very difficult, because the more similarity exists between two people, the more difficult it is to distinguish them. But if I ask Mary's husband which one is Mary, certainly he'll be able to identify her without a problem, since he knows her intimately. Because the closer you are to a person, the easier it is to identify them. And that's why Satan imitates God so much and parallels everything he does. Because the more he resembles God, the easier it is to trick people. And Satan is an expert in people. He knows that we prefer emotions over truths, because truth offends, while emotions, emotions delight. And this is the perfect recipe to deceive the masses. Therefore, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and he uses truths to little by little lead to lies, in a way so subtle that the lie is unnoticeable. Consequently, people believe they are following God when in fact they are being deceived by the devil. But for those of us who have a close relationship to God, we are able to identify the works of the devil as subtle and stealth as they may be. And that is how we believers who study the Bible and pay attention to the Holy Spirit are able to see the parallels the devil made between the Bible and the Egyptian religion. Just as the Bible shows a sea of chaos from which God began to create order, the same happens in the Egyptian myth of creation. 
Just as the Bible says that history repeats itself, so too the Egyptians believed in cyclical time. Just as the Bible says that the era of man will end in chaos and destruction, so too did the Egyptians believe. And just as the Bible says that a Redeemer will arrive to save us in the end, so too did the Egyptians believe. We know that Jesus is the Redeemer who will come after a great global tribulation to bring peace. But who is the parallel Redeemer that the Egyptians were waiting for? Surprisingly, the answer to this question can perhaps be found in a time and culture a lot more familiar to us than the long forgotten Egypt of old in the modern country of the United States of America. Seventeen seventy six, a new nation is born on the American continent. For their capital, a small territory is taken from the colony of Virginia. They begin to build their government buildings, headquarters, and streets, but with a very special design. All of it is being carefully placed following an astrological scheme and calendar, as if this city was being synchronized to celestial events and places. And if that weren't enough, many of the buildings, monuments, and art that decorate the city are replicas of ancient pagan architecture and symbolism. Which brings to the question, what were the designers of Washington DC thinking? Well, if one keeps in mind that these were Freemasons, then the answer might become apparent. Freemasons are practically the most powerful known secret society in the world. Their members stem from the political, military, executive, entertainment, and other branches of the social elite. Here's what's so funny. The word Mason basically means bricklayer, and Freemasons are definitely not bricklayers. So then why do they call themselves Masons? Well, because they are bricklayers. Just not of houses or buildings, but of societies. The purpose of Freemasonry is to build a new civilization and they plan to be the bricklayers who build it. Okay, and what does that have to do with ancient Egypt? Well, that the ancient Egyptians had the same objective. We already saw that God's purpose is to teach man to synchronize the physical with the spiritual by means of and subject to his word. And we already saw how Satan imitates God. And we already saw how ancient Egypt is at times a prophetic shadow of today's secular world. So let's analyze what the Egyptians of antiquity were doing with their society to find out what is happening in our society. The Egyptians, by means of the supernatural power and knowledge that was given to them by Satan, were configuring their constructions with astronomical movements and constellations. Just as Moses built the tabernacle to synchronize the heavens and the earth, so too the Egyptians built pyramids for the same thing, an imitation synchronization. Now, if the celestial temple of God was replicated on earth with the tabernacle, what celestial structure were the pyramids replicating? To answer this, let's look at the religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. They believed in Tep Sepi, the first time. This is supposedly the first Egyptian golden era when the gods lived with men, thus creating a utopist and advanced society. But the best thing about Tep Sepi was that Osiris and Isis reigned over the people until Seth arrived and killed Osiris. With Osiris dead and Isis in hiding with his heir, the age of gods and men came to an end, and the deterioration of their society due to the separation of domains was simply a matter of time. This was prophesized in a few ancient manuscripts such as the admonition of Ipur, a papyrus found from ancient Egypt where a wise priest called Ipur depicts Egypt in chaos and destruction. Indeed the face is pale, the bowman is ready, wrongdoing is everywhere, and there is no man of yesterday. Death is not lacking. How terrible! What am I to do? Towns are destroyed and Upper Egypt has become an empty waste. But even in ruin and calamity, Ipur proclaims the hope of a redeemer. Behold, he is the herdsman of mankind, and there is no evil in his heart. Where is he today? In another ancient text known as the Asclepius, the Egyptian god of wisdom, Thought, supposedly says to his favorite disciple, Or are you ignorant, Asclepius, that Egypt is the image of heaven? Moreover, it is the dwelling place of heaven and all the forces that are in heaven. If it is proper for us to speak the truth, our land is the temple of the world, and it is proper for you not to be ignorant of the time that will come in it. For all divinity will leave Egypt, and will flee upward to heaven, and Egypt will be widowed, it will be abandoned by the gods. Egypt, Egypt will become like the fables. Darkness will be preferred to light, and death will be preferred to life. No one will gaze into heaven. And once more, the announcement is made of a redeemer to come in the midst of the chaos. 
And when these things had happened, Asclepius, then the Lord, the Father and God, will take away error and cut off evil. And this is the birth of the world. The restoration of the nature of the pious ones who are good will take place. Hard times were announced for the Egyptians, but in the end, the hope for the return to that golden era of balance and order when the gods walked with men. And for this, they built the replica of the heavens on the earth, creating that so necessitated link between both. But replica of what? As we've already seen, the myth goes in that Isis was able to resuscitate Osiris just enough time to procreate with him and be impregnated with a legitimate heir to the throne. After which Osiris died once again and the first mummification was performed on his body for the purpose of sending him to the Duat, or the Kingdom of the Dead, which was in the stars. Osiris at his death ascended to the Duat becoming the constellation of Orion and receiving the title of Lord of the Duat. This gave initiation to the mummification rite for all the succeeding pharaohs so that they could unite with Osiris upon death. We see this in the pyramid text. O king, you are this great star, the companion of Orion, who traverses the sky with Orion, who navigates the Duat with Osiris. The sky has borne you with Orion. May you ascend to the sky, may the sky give birth to you like Orion. Live and be young beside your father Osiris, beside Orion in the sky. But where was this Duat, and how did they send dead pharaohs there? Well, that's what the pyramids were for. The pyramids are the connection to the Duat through which the souls of the dead pharaohs could depart and be reborn as a star of Orion, also known as Osiris. The pyramids of Egypt are the constellation of Orion Osiris on Earth. This is recorded in the pyramid text. O oh Horus, this king is Osiris, this pyramid of his is Osiris, this his temple is Osiris, approach thyself to him. Egypt was configured to be the portal to the Duat, the kingdom of the dead, and the pyramids are the body of the god of the dead, Osiris. Orion's belt points to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. If one looks at the Hopi mesas as the stars of Orion's belt, they also point to an important location, Chaco Canyon. But why Orion? And could it be merely a coincidence that this constellation pattern has been found at other important sites around the world? And always with the belt pointing toward a place of significance. Ancient astronaut theorists have discovered the constellation of Orion lining up with the Mayan complexes along the Street of the Dead in Mexico City. And here, Orion's belt points to Cholula, the largest pyramid in the world. They also find it at the Giza pyramids in Egypt, with the belt pointing toward the city of Heliopolis, a place of worship for ancient Egyptians. Now, a portal goes in two directions, meaning that just as the dead pharaohs could ascend, what's above can also descend. We're talking about some kind of doorway through which the kingdom of the dead, the Duat, has access to the natural world. Was this what Jesus was talking about when he said that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church? In other words, that the pyramids and all that they'll bring from the Duat to the earth, as incredible and powerful as it may seem, won't triumph against God and his saints? If that's the case, then what incredible powerful thing can we expect to arrive through this interdimensional portal in Egypt? Well, let's remember the prophecies of the Asclepius and the admonitions of Ipuer that Egypt will return to its first state, to a golden age of gods and men. The pyramids and obelisk are the proclamation and the confirmation of the soon arrival of this new era and the return of the gods of antiquity. For that reason is why we see obelisks located in cities around the world, and as usual, the public at large doesn't have a clue as to what they are. We already saw that an obelisk and a circle represent the act of Atum Ra masturbating, and we see the symbolism around the world over and over again.
but the worst of them being in the very institution that should be denouncing such works instead of embracing them, the Vatican. And here's where the Protestants start with the anti-Catholic rants, that the Vatican is the great harlot, that it's the church of Satan, etc. Okay, well, let's take a look at Protestant churches. See my friends, this isn't a problem of Catholicism, this is a problem of everybody. Satan has infiltrated absolutely every Christian church in existence. All of us are in disobedience in one thing or another, thanks to the confusion created by the devil with regards to the word of God. In conclusion, the world is full of esoteric cities, pagan architecture, and interdimensional temples. At the same time, our global civilization is completely disconnected from Jesus Christ and is in complete spiritual darkness. Everything is ready for the arrival of the new order of the ages, which the ancients so yearned for, and this thanks to the Freemasons. We have arrived at this point because the Freemasons are basically the secret continuation of the ancient Egyptian priesthood, and they have continued the agenda of molding societies for the return of the gods, only they've been doing it with a much more western look and feel. And still with all this, something's missing. We still don't have the catalyst of new eras, the Ben Ben Stone and the Phoenix. Because if we look at the Pyramid of Cheops, it's missing its Ben Ben Stone. It's as if the ancients were informing us that this portal will be activated once its Ben Ben Stone arrives. So where is it? Well, the Freemasons have been showing us for decades. On the $1 bill, we can find the missing Ben Ben Stone and the Phoenix. Okay, okay, it's an eagle. For now, let's focus on the Ben Ben Stone. Clearly we see that it's up above and has not yet landed on the pyramid. So the sign that we should be awaiting is a celestial sign. But what if the Ben Ben Stone already arrived? And what if it arrived and was caught on video? What if we take a look at it right now? A meteorite is the Ben Ben Stone. This is what the ancients saw and called the Seed of the Gods. Now, a little bit of astronomy. Turns out that some meteorites are made of iron, and these are completely black. And sometimes when they enter into the atmosphere, their trajectory is orientated, meaning they fall unidirectionally, without rotating wildly. When this happens, the front part of the meteorite starts to burn and melt, creating a very familiar figure in all this. This same figure is repeated on the area where the meteorite impacts. Both the meteorite and its impact area end up with the shape of a cone pointing downwards since they come from the heavens to the earth. So then, if one intends to go from the earth to the heavens, well, the most logical thing to do is to aim the cone upwards. And with that, you have yourself a heaven-earth-heaven -heaven portal. But the Freemasons offer us even more information with their design on the dollar. Because if we look at this Ben Ben stone, we see that it carries an occupant. The eye that we see here belongs to Horus. This Ben Ben stone is not just any seed of any god, it is the seed of Osiris, Lord of the Dead, sending us his son to take his place as legitimate heir to the throne of Egypt. In other words, the throne of the world. The Egyptians of yesterday, the Freemasons of today, have announced that Horus, son of the Lord of the Duat, Osiris, and the Queen of Heaven, Isis, is going to return to the world to take his place as king and take humanity to the new world order. Man has been proclaiming the beginning of a new era involving the return of celestial beings since ancient times. So, can we really expect a god with the head of a hawk to suddenly appear in the sky? 
No, because the truth is, this Horus god does not exist. Neither does Isis, neither Osiris. These were simply demons, taking on certain aspects and personifications according to the culture and era in which they were operating in. And after convincing those societies they were gods, they proceeded to inundate them with lies about how creation happened, what exists in the spiritual realm, what happens after death, etc. That way, manipulating and maintaining the masses away from the truth of the God of Israel. Now, in the past, such representations and fables worked great for a pagan and superstitious world, but today it wouldn't have the same results because of two predominant elements in modern society. On the spiritual side, there are the Abrahamic faiths which basically did away with pantheism, and on the physical side, there's science, which has given way to accepted theories such as the Big Bang and evolution. But none of this is a problem for Satan, because he's an expert in deceit and manipulation. He simply gets his demons together for an extreme makeover session, and then lets them loose on society with the same lies but more adapted to modern times, without straying from the original plan. So, for the demons who had the stellar roles of Isis and Horus, Satan gave them a more suitable look for the present. The Virgin Mary, the new image for the ancient Isis, which is now compatible not only with Christianity, but also Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age, Wicca, and practically all other religions, which puts the Virgin Mary in the extraordinary position of being the common denominator for so many different religions, which in turn makes it possible for her to unite all religions under one great universal scheme. As for her former son Horus, he also is given a brand new image. And what is it? Well, what's interesting is that each religion has a version of the arrival of a redeemer for humanity. So this Horus will have to be somebody who fulfills the expectations of everyone. It would seem like a very difficult task, but truth is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Even though we live in a time with more information and access to information than in all previous eras combined, and even though we have more advances in science and technology than ever before, society continues to be as pagan and superstitious as always. It doesn't matter how much a society advances materially, to continue without Jesus is to continue in darkness. And if you look around, you'll see that nothing has changed. Just as there was idol worship in the past, there's idol worship in the present. Pagan priest, pagan priest. Temple prostitutes? Temple prostitutes. Religious fanaticism? Religious fanaticism. And so, there is a modern version for practically everything of the past, because darkness is darkness, regardless of the century. But I would like to analyze a prophet, quote unquote, of our modern paganism, the late Hollywood director Stanley Kubrick, because I believe that he reveals something important in one of his movies. 2001, A Space Odyssey. A movie that set a milestone for its revolutionary special effects and state-of-the-art projections. But most of all, a movie that nobody understood. In its own premiere, more than 200 people walked out, including renowned actor Rock Hudson, who said upon leaving, Will someone tell me what the hell this is about? And yet, this was practically the intention of the film's creators as if only those with eyes to see and ears to hear would understand this movie and its message, since it was communicating a new era for humanity. Let's analyze. The movie begins with monkeys, excuse me, primitive humans, and from the heavens, a black stone arrives. The monkeys, excuse me, primitive humans, touch the black monolith and then become intelligent, triggering the evolution to modern man we see in the conquest of space, where once again they run into another black monolith on the moon. After battling a deranged computer, the sole survivor of the Discovery crew goes on a fantastic voyage to a space house, which ages him prematurely, and where the monolith appears once more to turn him into a baby. This movie makes no sense, unless you know Egyptian mythology. Then the movie makes sense. All of this is ancient Egyptian religion in Hollywood science fiction format. This black monolith is the Benben Stone, which descends from above, announcing a new era for humanity. The first time we see it, it initiates the era of modern man. And at the end of the movie, it turned the astronaut into a baby. Why? Because remember that when the pharaohs died, they were sent to the duat by means of the pyramids, 
to be reborn as a star of Orion Osiris. And this is what happened to the astronaut. He represents modern man at the maximum stage for that species, and the Ben Ben Stone has arrived announcing that he will now be taken to the next stage of evolution, to the new era for mankind. The astronaut, just like the pharaohs, was reborn in the stars as a superior being. But here's where it gets interesting. We know that the Ben Ben Stone is cone-shaped. Even in the book The Sentinel, which inspired the movie 2001, the Ben Ben Stone was a pyramidian. But for the movie, Kubrick made it rectangular. Why? Well, because Kubrick was showing us his modern concept of what would be the catalyst which would take humanity into the new era. And what do you know? Take a good look at this Ben Ben Stone. What does it look like? I'll give you a hint. Today, we see it everywhere. If you're still unable to see it, that's because it's somewhat crooked. There. Kubrick's Ben Ben Stone is a flat screen. Kubrick was showing us with astonishing precision that the era of information technology, represented here with a flat screen, would be what takes humanity to its next age. And where does this rectangular format so omnipresent in our society come from? It comes from Hollywood. All these screens and devices we have are a replica of the movie screen, because contrary to the television format, which was almost square, the cinema format offers a wider view. It gives more extensive vision, with more information and ability to see. In a way, it opens people's eyes. This is practically the same thing that the Egyptians proclaimed with their god king Horus. He had a hawk's head because hawks have a more advanced vision than humans. They can see further away, beyond what we see. The Eye of Horus represents a god who will open the eyes of society and illuminate them. However, the true source of illumination and wisdom comes from God and his word, and these have been systematically eliminated in large part from our societies and lives, while at the same time, flat screens have become omnipresent in our society and saturated with enormous quantities of garbage and stupidity which in turn feeds the insatiable appetite that the general public has developed for it. The result of all this is obvious, widespread immorality, ignorance, and distraction. These are the true catalysts that will bring about the new era. Information technology and mass media were simply the tools used to create this situation. With the morality, God is turned into the bad guy, becoming too politically incorrect and intolerant for a society that sees him as obsolete and tyrannical. With ignorance, people have no idea that we are in the end of days, thinking that everything happening is due to natural or artificial cycles of the planet and that it correspondingly has natural or artificial solutions. And with distraction, Satan can operate freely in their lives and societies without them even noticing it. And so Satan continues with his agenda of taking us to the new era in which the gods will return to earth. But what does the Bible say about all this? Well, the Bible does say that there will be some kind of new era arriving, just as the pagans said. It informs us that three beings will arrive to earth doing great supernatural signs and wonders, so amazing that everybody will be fascinated by them. Except that contrary to all other sources, the Bible reveals the true identity of these beings that are soon to arrive. Satan, the Antichrist, and the False Prophet. Remember, Satan imitates God and parallels what he does. And these three beings are a parallel to the Holy Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. According to eschatological interpretations of the Bible, God will abandon this world and give Satan free reign for seven years. And thanks to the lack of understanding that exists in societies, it will be very easy for this satanic trinity to deceive the masses. All the pagan prophecies, both ancient and modern, will be fulfilled to a greater or lesser extent by these three. For the religious or spiritual, the Virgin Mary will be the one manipulating them so to think that this is of God. But what about those who are not religious or spiritual, who are atheist or scientific? Well, Satan is prepared for everything. For them, the deception will be something with which they can identify with. Remember in chapter 1 when I said that the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary was given by Pope Pius for no reason whatsoever? Well, that wasn't exactly true. The truth is that there was something that influenced him to make such a decision. Pope Pius saw a UFO! Seriously, he saw a UFO, only that the Catholic Church refers to it differently. The Miracle of the Sun. It all began a long time ago in a town called Fatima in Portugal. And in this town, there were three little shepherds who witnessed the most famous apparition to date of the Virgin Mary. When they brought together the entire town and thousands of people and journalists from around the world, everybody saw the famous miracle of the sun, which began spinning in the sky, changing to different colors, and finally falling towards the crowd. But just as it was about to impact, it changed course and returned to its original place. 
There's just one little problem with this event, and it's that the sun is massive. If it will begin to dance around the sky, the whole world would see it, not just one group of people. Even worse, if it fell towards the Earth, nobody would be alive to talk about it. This dancing circle was not the sun. Years later, Pope Pius XII said to have seen the same event four times. In his papal notes, he said, I have seen the miracle of the sun. The sun, which was still quite high, looked like a pale, opaque sphere, entirely surrounded by a luminous circle. It moved outward slightly, either spinning or moving from left to right and vice versa. The description that this pope gave is practically the standard testimony given by those who have had a close encounter of a third kind. Luminous spheres, abrupt movements, radiation of colors, etc. And if that weren't enough, it turns out that the Vatican is highly involved with astronomy. Not because it's an institution dedicated to cosmic sciences, but because apparently it's getting ready to make contact with extraterrestrials. April 2nd, 2005. Pope John Paul II, the second longest serving pope in history, dies. He is praised as being one of the most influential leaders in the 20th century. April 8th, at 6.03 a.m., hours before John Paul's funeral, an unidentified flying object is filmed by a security camera observing St. Peter's Basilica. Could this mysterious object be evidence of a connection between the Vatican and alien life? Strange-looking craft begin to appear in Christian art as early as the 1400s. Quite frequently, artists would put symbols in the sky, but uh, in a couple of cases, they kind of looked like flying saucers. One painting, the Madonna with San Giovannino, depicts the Lady Madonna in the foreground and San Giovannino in the background pointing up to the sky, and he sees a craft that is clearly visible in the painting. In the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance, they would take events from the present and depict them in the paintings. These were real things that people saw in the sky. In The Miracle of the Snow, you have a painting of Jesus and Mary above, and below it appears to be a what could be described as a fleet of UFOs or flying saucers directly below them. The Baptism of Christ, painted in 1710, shows what looks like a flying saucer beaming down toward Jesus. The crucifixion features a pair of what look like UFOs. Are the objects captured in these works of art records of religious devotion or evidence of the church's connection to spacecraft and perhaps even creatures from another world? Unsealed case file, the sighting at Fatima. 1917, the climax of World War I. Portugal attempts to remain neutral in the global conflict. The country is gripped with fear, and its people are looking for a sign of what's to come. On October 13th, 1917, in Fatima, Portugal, a mass UFO sighting with more than 70,000 witnesses took place. During the event, the rain stopped. Some witnesses believed that the clouds parted, and what was described as a saucer-shaped craft came down from the heavens above towards Earth. According to eyewitnesses, three children approached the vision and witnessed an apparition of a beautiful woman. The vision reportedly included a glowing globe-shaped vehicle, showering rose petals, that disappeared upon hitting the ground. According to the girls, the apparition gave them a cryptic message. Over the years, and they attribute that to being the Virgin Mary, but it's very possible that this could have been something else. That apparition, that vision, gave a prophecy to those three little girls, and it was a vision of the future, a prophecy of the future. The message has been interpreted as images from an apocalyptic future. It is filled with flaming swords and so-called demons who come in the forms of frightful and unknown animals. Could the Vatican be hiding details that this frightening message is warning of a coming alien invasion? A lot of the information for Fatima really didn't come out until about the year 2000. It's believed even to this day that not everything has been revealed. If this really was a message from another world, and it was a warning, a lot of people ask, should we know? 
visions, lights in the sky, sightings and messages from strange beings. Reports of possible UFO activity continue to be reported around the world. And according to experts, the Vatican openly investigates them. In 2011, a group of people um, on the Ivory Coast of Africa saw a light in the sky. It wasn't just a light in the sky, it was a diamond-shaped light in the sky. And it was so vivid, so compelling, that for that moment, that group was transfixed by the light. And it changed their lives. Recently, such unidentified sightings have increased around the world. Peru, Brazil, Russia, and China, all UFO hotspots report mass sightings that seem to come as visions. Just outside Rome stands Castel Gandolfo, a satellite Vatican estate that serves as the summer residence of the Pope and headquarters for Vatican astronomers. Two large domes on the roof each house massive telescopes used to study the heavens since the 1930s. The astrophysicist Vatican Observatory have been interested in the question of extraterrestrial life for quite a while. Dr. Funes, the Vatican Observatory director, affirmed the possibility of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligences. In a universe uh, so big, uh, probably with the many of these stars uh, having planets, it would be possible that a life could evolve the way we know on Earth. Here's a strange story. In 1998, there were excavations being done under the Vatican Library. And one of the workers on the excavation team found the strange skulls. They were elongated, extended skulls. They looked like what you would think a gray alien skull would look like. The oversized, slanted eye sockets, the relatively small nose and mouth, the dome-like cranium, the similarities between its structure and the heads of the gray alien, the ET life form most commonly described by witnesses, are obvious. But why are skulls allegedly under the Vatican? The Vatican is built on the ruins of ancient Rome. And underneath the Vatican is what's known as a necropolis. A necropolis is a vast burial ground. So there could be skulls dating back not just to 2,000 years from the birth of Christ, but all the way dating back to the beginning of Rome. Perhaps the conclusion was best put by a nun who stated, whatever those remains represent, there's a reason why the good fathers buried them there to be forgotten. So not only can the Virgin Mary unite the religions of the world, but she can also unite the supernatural with the paranormal. She is perfect for uniting all these elements and convincing the world that this is all to evolve us to the human utopia that the world has always dreamt of, and in the companionship of celestial beings who will have returned. However, the Bible has revealed to us that this is the work of the devil to give the Antichrist control of the world. The truth is, whatever is about to arrive, whether by means of the pyramids, UFOs, or whatever, will be completely diabolical, and the Virgin Mary will be the one orchestrating it all. Obviously, such declarations are very offensive to many. How can I possibly say such things about the Virgin if everything she does and says is to draw us closer to God? How many have not converted to God thanks to her? Could it be that I'm the one who's mistaken? Well, let's analyze this. First, let's look in the Bible to see who are the most religious and who proclaimed Jesus' name the loudest in the Gospels. It wasn't the apostles since their faith failed them many times. It wasn't the Pharisees because they were divided on who Jesus was. It wasn't the priest because they wanted to kill him. The ones who were the most religious in the Bible were the demons. While everyone else had doubts or simply didn't understand who Jesus was, the demons ran to him, proclaiming him aloud. So much so that Jesus had to silence them as in Mark 1.34, or as in the case of the possessed young woman in Acts 16, who when she saw Paul in company, she also began proclaiming God aloud for many days. So, the virgin proclaims God, the demons in the Bible did too. It's no big deal. Even nowadays they do so. Let's look at one case. <laughs> Do 
Annalisa Michelle was a young German woman who was supposedly possessed and died from the physical deterioration that this eventually caused her. Her case inspired the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose, among others. According to her, she was possessed by 10 demons, and these seemed to be quite religious, especially towards the Catholic faith, since supposedly they said things like, you should follow the message of Fatima, the rosary should be recited or else it is the end. Catholics have the true doctrine and they run after the Protestants like prostitutes. If people knew what was in store for them by not going to church, it will fare them extremely bad. They no longer obey the Pope in Rome. It is the one in Rome who still keeps the church going. Other manifestations of Annalisa included an obsessive compulsion to kneel down hundreds of times a day to the point of bursting her kneecaps and stigmas that would suddenly appear on her hands and feet. But worst of all was that Annalisa voluntarily chose to be possessed and tormented to death because somebody influenced her to do so. Guess who that somebody was. To było pewnej niedzieli. Jej przyjaciel Piotr pojechał z nią na spacer do rajskiego młyna. Na polnej drodze wysiedli z samochodu i poszli razem na spacer. Anelizę bardzo źle się czuła. Prawie nie mogła mówić. Wtedy ukazała się jej Matka Boża. Przeszły tak kawałek drogi. Może dziwić, że Matka Boża z kimś spaceruje, bo to trochę jak z powieści. Spacerowały tak po parku. Szły jedna koło drugiej. Podczas tego spaceru Matka Boża powiedziała Jest wielkim cierpieniem mojego serca, że w tym czasie bardzo wiele dusz trafia do piekła. Trzeba czynić pokutę za księży, za młodzież i za twoją ojczyznę. Czy chcesz czynić pokutę za te dusze, które inaczej będą potępione na wieczność? On stał, a Anelizę uklękła i modliła się. W tym momencie widzenie zakończyło się. Kiedy powrócili tu, do domu, Anelizę wbiegła po schodach na górę. Przyszła i powiedziała, mamo, mamo, popatrz na mnie. Ja mogę znów chodzić, mogę skakać, podskakiwać, tańczyć. Ukazała mi się Matka Boża. Pomyślałam, chyba niedobrze usłyszałam. Objawiła się Matka Boża? Nie, to niemożliwe, ona zwariowała. Tak, tak, powiedziała, ukazała mi się Matka Boża. Powiedziała to kilka razy. I Matka Boża kazała mi czynić pokutę, bo inaczej wiele dusz pójdzie do piekła. Przyszłam do Anelizy. Ona wtedy całymi dniami i nocami klęczała albo stała przed krzyżem. I powiedziałam, Anelizę, nie możesz tego zrobić. Odpowiedziała, mogę, mamo. Jeśli ja nie zrobię teraz tego, co powiedziała mi Matka Boża, to będę winna, że tak wiele dusz pójdzie do piekła i będą na wieczność potępione. Wtedy i ja będę winna.
One of the most vile, profane, immoral, and evil acts that exist is that of demonic possession, and this is what the Virgin wanted for Annalisa, blackmailing her with the supposed condemnation of thousands of people if she didn't agree to it. But Annalisa Michelle was not the only victim of the Queen of Heaven, because this combination of possession, emotional blackmail, and torture is also evident in more famous cases of Marian apparitions. Let's take a look at the most famous of all, Fatima. In 1917, the Virgin Mary appeared to three little Portuguese shepherds named Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco. And among many other things, she told them, Do you want to offer yourselves to God and accept all the sufferings that He wants to send you? You'll have to suffer a lot. These were children of 7 to 10 years of age. Obviously, they wanted to please the Virgin, for which they said yes, especially considering the Virgin told them that if they didn't accept, thousands of people would go to hell. Oh, and they also had to pray the rosary every day or they will be responsible of prolonging the First World War. I'm not a psychologist, but I believe that those types of responsibilities can somewhat affect a little child. Let's continue. In her book, Fatima and Lucia's Own Words, Sister Lucia wrote, The Blessed Virgin recommended to us the practice of mortification. Some days later, as we were walking along the road with our sheep, I found a piece of rope that had fallen off a cart. I picked it up and just for fun, tied it around my arm. Before long, I noticed that the rope was hurting me. Look! This hurts, I said to my cousins. We could tie it around our waist and offer the sacrifice to God. We then set about dividing it between the three of us. This instrument of penance often caused us terrible suffering. Now and then, Jacinta couldn't hold back her tears because of the tremendous discomfort this caused her. Whenever I urged her to remove it, she replied, No, I want to offer this sacrifice to our Lord in reparation and for the conversion of sinners. Jacinta and Francisco continued using the rope during the day for more than a year, at least until October of 1918, when both fell ill almost simultaneously. One day, Francisco gave me the rope, saying, Take it away before my mother sees it. I don't feel able to wear it anymore around my waist. A few days after falling ill, she gave me back the rope she had been wearing and said, Keep it for me. I'm afraid my mother may see it. If I get better, I want it back. This cord had three knots and was somewhat stained with blood. Other sacrifices that these three little shepherds made with the approval of the Virgin were rubbing their bodies with nettles, a plant that causes skin irritation with intense itching, abstaining from food, not drinking water on hot summer days, among others. When Jacinta and Francisco fell ill, they saw this as the best sacrifice they could offer God, for which they did not desire to get better, and instead continued afflicting their already weakened bodies with additional sacrifices. They simply resigned to dying, which finally happened for both of them at the tender ages of 9 and 10. In 1961, the Virgin appeared to four young schoolgirls in Garabandal, Spain, and these began to manifest very strange behaviors, such as seen here, where one exhibits an obsessive compulsion of kissing a black idol and making those around her kiss it also. They also walk backwards with their heads tilted back. Something completely unnatural for humans. Reason why it's so effective in horror movies. They went into all kinds of trances and ecstasies which could last for hours, and their bodies contorted and stiffened. Exactly the same thing that would happen to Annalisa Michelle. Emily? Hey. It's incredible that with such manifestations, nobody realized what was really happening to them. I want you to think for just one moment if these were your children. 
Think of all that you do to protect your children from the dangers of this world. Think of how sacred their lives and the integrity of their bodies and minds are. Think about how you'd feel if you found out that someone had been talking to them behind your backs to convince them to be raped, to get sick, to be tortured, or to practice self-mutilation. And that if they didn't do so or allow it, thousands of people would go to hell for all eternity and they would make God very sad. Think about how you would feel if your children met somebody that psychotic. Because believe it or not, like it or not, that's what the Virgin Mary does. It's not I who says so, it's her very own victims in their very own testimonies and biographies. There are many more events like this in other apparitions, but what definitely proves without a shadow of a doubt that the Virgin Mary is a demon are the declarations she makes when she manifests. They are completely blasphemous and anti-biblical statements. Let's look at and compare only a few with the Bible. All of the following declarations have approval of the Catholic Church. She claims to be our savior. I alone am able still to save you from the calamities which will approach. Those who place their confidence in me shall be saved. Let's compare this with the Bible. Jesus, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. She says she's our redeemer. The affliction of Christ was my affliction because his heart was my heart. Adam and Eve sold the world for one apple, my son and I redeemed that same world with one heart. Isaiah 47 4, our redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name. She's mediatrix. Little children, I am the mother of good counsel, mediator, who is trying to persuade you to listen to the call. My message is of faith, love and hope. More than anything, it brings reconciliation between people and nations. It is the only thing that can save this century from war and eternal death. 1 Timothy 2 For there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Intercessor with my son I have intervened so many times to appease the wrath of the Father. I have prevented the coming of calamities by offering him the sufferings of the Son on the cross. Romans 8 Christ, who also makes intercession for us, without sin. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Romans 3 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Likewise, there are a dozen more of these blasphemous declarations of the Virgin Mary, which directly contradict dozens and dozens of affirmations and instructions in the Bible. And it's not just her declarations, but also her petitions. Since she's obsessed with people praying the rosary fanatically, building altars to honor her in all the places of her apparitions, and making sacrifices to save souls. And what does the Bible say about this? When you pray, use not vain repetitions. I am the Lord, this is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Christ, after he had suffered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Narcissistic, psychotic, blasphemous, sadomasochist, idolatrous, vain, pagan. All the evidence that this being is demonic is given. How is it possible that the world believes that this is the mother of God and the queen of heaven? How is it possible that they kneel before this and offer it prayers? Well, because that's how clever Satan is. He is the prince of this world, and because of this, he has saturated us with immorality, ignorance, and distraction. People do not know what the Bible says, and if they do know, they don't accept it, since it doesn't agree with their personal feelings. What they want is pleasure, not truth. And the Virgin Mary offers a lot of emotional pleasure. While the Bible, you have to study it and read it, obey, it. How boring is the Bible compared to the loving virgin? And all this without mentioning all the miracles, like those statues that cry and bleed and blink. The Bible utterly prohibits the use of images. God hates these images. The idolaters know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, shall I bow down to a block of wood? Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. With whom will you compare me or count me equal? They hire a goldsmith to make it into a god, and they bow down and worship it. They lift it to their shoulders and carry it. They set it up in its place, and there it stands. From that spot, it cannot move. Even though someone cries out to it, it cannot answer. It cannot save them from their troubles. Remember this. Keep it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. I am God, and there is none like me. The customs of the people are vain, for one cuts a tree out of the forest, 
the work of the hands of the workmen, with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers, that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, and speak not. They have to be carried, because they cannot go. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. But people simply don't care. They completely ignore the Bible and decide for themselves what is or isn't of God. Exactly the same thing that the Hebrews did in the Sinai Desert. There is nothing new under the sun. So, your idol of Mary cries? It leaks oil? It winks? Well, surprise, surprise. The idols of Egypt did the same. It's no big deal. These manifestations are simply more evidence of the Marian connection to Egyptian paganism. In a fragment of an inscribed stone known as the Palermo Stone that dates back to the 5th dynasty of ancient Egypt, we can read about the famous ritual of the opening of the mouth, in which animation was infused into statues so that they could see, hear, and speak. Now, you could discard this as superstitious fables, but remember that the Bible informs us that they, the ancient Egyptians, had the capability to turn staffs into serpents. That that is to say, a non-animated object into an animated one. Also, in the Bible, we see that this type of magic is going to return, since Revelation 13.15 tells us of a future statue in the Temple of Jerusalem that will speak and give orders. So these things are very real and very demonic, and yet we have people worshipping them. I'll say it again, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Even Ben Ben Stone veneration continues today. Simply consider the holiest place of the world's second biggest religion, Islam. Every year, thousands of Muslims travel to Mecca in Saudi Arabia to visit the Kaaba, or cube, where there are black stone fragments inside a very anatomical circle. And the Muslims stick their heads in this very anatomical circle to kiss these fragments, which are said to be a meteorite. But in my own city of Bogota, Colombia, you can see Ben Ben veneration every Sunday on the Montserrat Mountain. Turns out there's a basilica with an idol of a black Madonna. Which brings up the question, why is this lady Madonna black? If Mary ethnically was not black. Well, because this is a Ben Ben stone. Back in pagan times, it wasn't just the Egyptians who built temples and monuments to meteorites, but practically all cultures did so. There were many pagan temples where they worshipped meteorites, so many that we possibly see one in the very Bible. Acts 19.35 states that there was an object that fell from the sky and placed in a temple was venerated as Diana, goddess of the Ephesians. It's probable that this was a meteorite and was sculpted into the goddess's image. The Black Madonna of Montserrat is nothing more than a continuation of the tradition of worshipping black stones as goddesses. In her right hand, she's holding a ball, which has no meaning in Christianity, but in Ben Ben Paganism, this ball is where the phoenix kept its dead father's ashes mixed with Mira to transport to to Heliopolis for burial. All this part of the process for initiating the new era. The absolute proof that all this is paganism and satanic is given. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The Virgin Mary does not exist in the Bible. The Hebrew Miriam, mother of Jesus and wife of Joseph in the Gospels, is not the Virgin Mary. However, there are many who speak of supposed prophecies in the Bible about her. Some of these prophecies include Genesis 3.15 where the Virgin is said to defeat Satan, the Ark of Testimony in the Pentateuch which is considered a prophetic symbol of the Virgin, some verses in Song of Solomon, Isaiah 7.14 where a virgin giving birth is foretold, and the famous Revelation 12 interpreted as the Virgin Mary clothed in the sun and crowned with stars. Stars. In the Bible, there are women, and there are women who are figurative. And many times, when the Bible speaks of nations, peoples, or cities in a figurative sense, it uses the depiction of a woman. For example, Isaiah 47 speaks of Babylon as an arrogant young woman who is humiliated. Ezekiel 16 speaks of Jerusalem as a miserable young woman rescued by God. Ezekiel 16.46 speaks of Samaria and Sodom as sisters. In that same sense, Genesis 3.15 is speaking of a figurative woman, not a real 
real one, since this woman has seed, which is biologically impossible for a woman. And this figurative woman and the devil will be enemies since her seed will defeat him. Obviously, this seed refers to Jesus. Therefore, this woman is unquestionably the nation of Israel. Secular history gives testimony to this as Satan has always tried to destroy the Jews, his great enemy, because their reunification signals the return of Jesus. The Ark of Testimony has been interpreted as the Virgin Mary because inside this Ark are the Ten Commandments, which is the Word of God. And this supposedly symbolizes Jesus and Mary's womb, a lovely interpretation, but solely based on emotion. The truth is, the Bible offers a very long and detailed description of the temple where the Ark was kept, with which you can conclude that the temple's design is based on the pattern of the human body. At the same time, the New Testament states that our bodies are the temple of God, and thus, the elements of the sanctuary speak of our bodies. And what do they represent? First, we have the brass altar, where animals were killed. But it should be understood that this altar was practically a barbecue grill, since almost everything burned on it was eaten. The whole concept of this altar was to prepare food and eat it before God, since eating with someone represents communion. We can see this in Malachi 1, where God himself says that this altar is like his table. In this way, this altar can represent the mouth. The golden lampstand provided light inside the holy place, and this light is symbol of the word of God. For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. This way, the lampstand can represent an eye, since God told us to be focused on his commandments and instructions. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. The showbread table was on the opposite side. We know that bread is symbolic of Jesus and that Jesus is the word of God or the Torah made flesh of which the word tells us, keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of your eye. Once again, this can represent having our eyes focused on Jesus and on his word, which is our spiritual food. The altar of incense offered a sweet aroma to God, which can symbolize the life given to us by Jesus. In this way, it can represent the nose, and above the nose and eyes is the mind, represented here with the Ark of the Covenant and the Commandments. What does this mean? It means that God wants us to always keep his commandments in our minds. Beware that you not forget the Lord in not keeping his commandments and judgments and statutes. You shall meditate Torah day and night, so to make sure you do according to all that is written therein. Remember the law. I will meditate in your precepts. I have not forgotten your law. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your testimonies are my meditation. There are a lot more details and levels of interpretation on all the elements of the temple and on the temple itself. Everything points to human anatomy with spiritual symbolism. Nothing points to a pregnant virgin. In the Song of Songs, there's a Sunamite woman as the protagonist who again represents the nation of Israel in a figurative sense. This woman walks in the ways of a harlot since she gives herself to a secular king who gives her material riches. But at the same time, she's in love with a humble shepherd who represents Jesus. Basically, it's a poem about God trying to win over his people Israel who betray and reject him continually. To place Mary in any way in this story is to create an incestuous romance between mother and son. For a better understanding on the correct interpretation of the book Song of Solomon, download my free ebook Revelation of the Marriage of the Lamb, where I dedicated an entire chapter to this topic. Isaiah 7.14 would seem to be a definite prophecy about the Virgin Mary, until one reads this verse in the original Hebrew language, which uses the word Alma that means damsel. Behold, a damsel shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. In this way, we have a double problem in that Alma doesn't necessarily translate virgin, and Emmanuel was never the name of Jesus. It was most likely a boy that was born of a young maiden in time of Isaiah, reason for which in Judaism, the Messiah is not expected to be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7.14 was officially revealed to be a messianic prophecy in the New Testament. Before that, it probably wasn't. And finally, Revelation 12, where we see the most famous depiction of the Virgin, a woman clothed in the sun with a crown of stars and standing on the moon. Symbolism which is used to decorate thousands and thousands of Marian idols and images in one of the worst misinterpretations ever of this chapter. The Bible again refers to the nation of Israel with this figurative woman of Revelation 12. 
not the virgin. All that is needed is a very small eschatological study and a desire to know the truth to understand this. Let's take a look. The woman of Revelation 12 is directly and implicitly connected with Joseph's dream in Genesis 37, where he sees the sun, the moon, and 11 stars bowing to him. When he told this dream to his family, they correctly understood that these elements were representing them, the sun his father, the moon his mother, and the 11 stars his 11 siblings. Now, what's interesting about Joseph's family is that they were the nation of Israel on small scale. Jacob the father had his name changed by God to Israel, and each brother was the patriarch of what would eventually become the 12 tribes of Israel. In this way, the woman of Revelation is the same woman of Genesis 3.15, and her cosmic attire clearly identifies her as Israel, thanks to Joseph's dream and confirmed by Isaiah 66. Many will say that I don't respect the beliefs of others, the religions of others. But as you've already seen in this video, this is not about beliefs. This is about scams, lies, manipulations, things that the devil uses to take us down paths of destruction. So, as I said before, Put this to the test. Don't let your emotions judge for you. I know that you're offended with me. I know you want to insult me. But that doesn't change anything. Truth is truth. And if what I said was true, then you will have to make a decision. Test me. Test this video and its content. But judge it according to truth, not your emotions. The Bible says that in the end days, Satan will do great signs in the sky and will fool many people. And the Virgin Mary fits perfectly with this, with this plan. So judge this carefully, with truth, with a desire to know what's happening and what will happen, but according to truth, not according to your emotions or those things you've been taught all your life or you've always seen. Simply investigate and ask God to reveal things to you. Thank you for watching. God bless.